Welcome to Chautauqua People. My guest today is Amanda Gates. She grew up in, in Northern Virginia as a Pittsburgh native. She went to Catholic University. She currently has several appointments. During the year, she's assistant concert master of the Virginia Symphony. At Chautauqua, she's a first violin, and occasionally she subs in Pittsburgh. And Amanda has a great reputation as a violinist. She has an interest in not just classical music, but all sorts, and plays a variety of music during the year. Amanda, you're an 18 year Chautauquan. How did you find your way to Chautauqua? Uh, well, I was uh, married to my first husband, who is also a violinist in the Chautauqua Symphony. And so I came here the first year. I fell in love immediately, as so many of us do. And then the very next chance there was an opening, I auditioned for the orchestra. And I was lucky enough to secure a position, and I've been coming here ever since. Great. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me how the audition process works for a musician to join a major symphony? Sure. Um, it's very rigorous. So initially what happens is usually a symphony will solicit uh, applications with a resume, and then they'll normally invite a number of players to come and audition. And those auditions are almost invariably nowadays held behind a screen, and that is to uh, ensure uh, a blind and fair audition process and very often they'll go so far as to lay down some carpet so that they can't hear high heels or anything like that and there will be a number of rounds a preliminary and then maybe a semi-final round and then a final round and uh, in the final round some orchestras will keep that screen up others will take the screen down in some orchestras you'll see the resumes of the people who are auditioning and in other orchestras they'll keep the whole process completely anonymous using only numbers for the whole thing um, so that's the first step, is actually winning a position through an audition. And then uh, in orchestras, just as in academia, there's a tenure process. Uh, for us, in orchestras, it's, it's, slight, it's faster. It normally takes one or two seasons um, to determine if you're a good fit. And then your colleagues will vote. And when you get tenure, you're a fully-fledged member of the organization. Mm -hmm. What percentage uh, of the uh, musicians are normally given tenure? Um, it's normal to receive tenure in, unless there's an issue. I mean, the tenure year is really to determine how well you work with your peers. Um, so when you play an instrument, especially in a section like a violinist, it's not enough to just play the notes beautifully. Uh, you have to work with others. And you're part of 12, 13, sometimes 16 other violinists. And the idea is that you're all producing sound in exactly the same way with the exact same time and sense of style and, and paying close attention to what the leader of the section is indicating in terms of where he or she is playing and the bow, the style. You have, to be, uh, you have to be savvy enough to catch all those cues very quickly and adapt and uh, each orchestra is a little different in how they approach various repertoire. So uh, your tenure years are really for your peers to determine how good you are at fitting in with that particular orchestra. Can you catch on? Um, and so it's almost entirely secondary to how you play as a violinist, quite honestly. Now for other instruments in the orchestra that are more soloistic, you know, principal clarinet or oboe or something, it, it's, it's a little different. You're, you're meant to be a soloist almost every time you play. Mm -hmm. But certainly as a section violinist, uh, you're, you're really supposed to perform as part of a section, like, like the raquettes or mm -hmm. um, you know, synchronized swimming, something like that. So it's very important to be able to fit in, and that's what the tenure process is for. And the bowing should be precisely the same as, as the leadership. Correct. Now, tell, you have this position as assistant concert master in mm -hmm. Virginia. Yes. What does the concert master do? So uh, you discussed bowings, and that's one of the primary responsibilities of concert masters. Uh, they're really the liaison between a music director or conductor and the rest of the orchestra. And orchestras start with the string section, really. It's the meat and potatoes. So in order to make sure we're all producing the sound in the same way, you have to get the bowings the same. And as simple as it sounds, you might think, well, there's only two directions you can go, down or up. You'd be amazed at the variety of sounds you can achieve. By, uh, by various bow strokes, by various positions in the bow. The bow is weighted on one side, heavier than the other. Um, there's varieties in, in, the, in the amount of bow, horse hair that you put on the string, all kinds of varieties. And those are all decided 
by the concertmaster when they receive uh, the music that they're going to be performing. Um, normally they're familiar with it, a concertmaster would be familiar, and hopefully they'd be familiar if their music director is conducting, they'll know, oh, she likes it this way, so I'm going to start this down bow heavy at the frog because I know she likes a strong sound there. Or, you know, he really wants that transparent, so I'm going to do sort of a floaty style. All of that is indicated in the parts, which are then passed around to the other string principals, principal second violin, principal viola, principal cello, and principal bass. Those leaders of those sections take those bowings, translate them based on what their parts contain, and uh, then all of that is put into the parts by the orchestra's librarians. And uh, they transfer each marking by hand into each part. And it's a process that takes quite a long time. That's one of the responsibilities, and it's a very important one. Now, if a concertmaster t isn't familiar with the repertoire that's to be performed, for instance, uh, they might look for a score. Uh, they'd certainly listen to recordings um, and try and uh, try and do the very best bowings to convey what the composer intends. All of that can change in rehearsal. It's best not to change it too much because you're affecting, you know, upwards of 60 musicians at a time to mm -hmm. change. Uh, but that's one of the responsibilities and, and a very big one that most people aren't familiar with. Uh, you wouldn't think about it, but it's hugely important. Of course, the concertmaster is the one to play any solos that come up in the repertoire when it says solo or one violin. For instance, there's a very famous solo in Scheherazade because the violin is Scheherazade herself spinning her story, so that's a famous one. Uh, there are many other famous examples of solos. Often the concertmaster will perform at least one concerto per year, uh, usually by contract or by sort of understanding and agreement. Uh, so they're called upon to be an excellent soloist. They're called upon to organize the Boeings for the entire section. And also, very importantly, to be the liaison between the conductor and the rest of the orchestra. So a conductor may not be a string player. They might be uh, a flute player or our music director in Virginia right now is, is a classical guitarist. So if she wants a certain sound, she'll say the words to convey that certain sound. And then the concertmaster would be responsible for translating that into, okay, we're going to do this at the frog, martelet. All those words mean something to violinists with years of training. Um, so that's very important. Um, th all, of course, they're responsible for uh, roster and personnel matters. And uh, they listen to each and every audition that occurs for uh, a violin position, and m usually for every string position, certainly. Um, so they're very heavily involved in, in those kind of things. And if anything comes up, anything is uncomfortable at all between uh, a conductor and the orchestra, the concertmaster is the one that everyone looks to. Uh, how is he or she going to help us through this situation? You know, sometimes difficult conversations have to be had, um, and they'll be the ones to, to broker those. So I hope that tells you a little bit about what a concertmaster does. It does, and I had no yeah. idea the music was marked up like that. Mm -hmm. So I assume then you get a piece of music and it has those marks in pencil mm -hmm. from, and and indeed, then, if the music that's I performed five years later and is still in the orchestra's library, the old pencil marks are probably all erased, and then new ones put in to meet the current plan for that, that piece. That's another good comment, and it's actually kind of a question, too, because often what will happen, a concertmaster will put Boeings in the part and put his or her initials, so you know where the Boeings came from, so that next season or five seasons into the future when you're saying who did these bowings oh okay it was so and so and then also very often a concertmaster who makes those changes will put in parentheses other sets of initials and those are for the conductors who asked for a specific sound so so and so you know let's say it's ross and milanoff you, it, they might say rm because there's a series of down bows so he wanted like a hammered kind of sound mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of a living record of where the Boeings came from, where the stylistic decisions came from, so that you can go back and say to yourself, oh, when, when Ross and Milanoff played this piece, here's how he likes it. And when so-and-so conducted, she liked it like this, so we're going to change those. So you actually, you do need to erase them, but sometimes you want to preserve some of that so that you know institutionally and traditionally where they came from. So we're going to have Joanne Folletta, if I pronounced her name correctly, Yes. Uh, conduct. Yes. And we will probably keep her notes. Yes. Those would stay in there and somebody might, 10 years from now, might take the music and say, well, who was JF? And, yeah. Uh -huh. we, we use J-A-F, Joanne Folletta, but yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. 
And she's our music director in Virginia currently. She is? Yes, but she's in the last year of her tenure there. So okay. um, she'll be leaving after this coming season. So in Virginia, we're in a search process for okay. a new conductor. And I know people in Buffalo like her immensely. Uh -huh. So, yeah. so that's, that's an interesting point. Now let's just talk a few more minutes about your instrument. Okay. You, let's say you have a um, wonderful situation. You won the lottery mm -hmm. and you're filthy rich. <laughs> and you can go out and buy a new violin. Mm -hmm. What would you look for? How would you go about doing it? Okay, that's another great question, but I'm gonna break your rules a little bit and say, the first thing I'd look to do would be to give some money to the endowment for my particular symphony orchestra <laughs> or okay. institution, because that way it lives forever and lasts forever. But let's say it's such a large amount that I could afford to both do that and purchase a new violin. Okay. Um, I would go to New York City and mm -hmm. I would go, to, there are a couple famous buildings, which I can't remember the exact addresses, that have uh, a lot of violin makers, which are called luthiers, mm -hmm. and violin brokers and sellers. Um, and I would try out all the instruments that they had. Uh, when I was looking for my current violin, I, I did just that. I went to several different places, including um, the place where I did purchase my violin, which is no longer in business, but it was called Mennings in Philadelphia, and a lot, a lot of violinists bought their violins there. And uh, you know, I gave them a price range. I said, here's what I can afford. And then they would come out with 10 violins in that price range. And you know, I can't tell from looking at them what they are. Some people can, but I'm not that savvy. Mm -hmm. And I would just simply play them and listen to the sound. And you, as you can imagine, it's very personal. Yeah. Y you want to hear a good sound, but you also want it to feel right for your particular physical capabilities and proclivities. So you would do all that. Then, say you might narrow it down to two or three. Oh, this one is great. This one has a huge sound um, under my ear. And, and this one is, is less big sound, but it's so easy to play, so facile. I'd like to take them into a hall and play them in, in a space where uh, you know, the projection might be an issue. So very often what happens is a violin maker will allow you to take them out on trial for a week, mm -hmm. say. Um, so I would do that and I would get uh, a group of peers that I trusted to come and listen. And then I'd ask them to play it so that I could listen in the mm -hmm. back of the hall. And that would all affect my decision. Often in that process, you would also sort of get a second opinion on the violin. Mm -hmm. uh, I have done that, taken it to a, another luthier, not told them where it was coming from, but I would say, this is what was told to me, this violin's prov provenance. And can you look it over, tell me what you think, tell me about the health of the violin, make sure there's nothing that I'm missing in terms of, you know, sometimes you get like wormholes or, or cracks that you can't see immediately. Um, so that's also part of the process that I went to to get my violin and, and what I would do in the future as well. Um, and you would try and sit with it as long as possible because it's often, as you can imagine, a major, major purchase. Often it costs more than, uh, than a home in many parts of the country. So you wanna make sure you're getting it right. So you wanna make sure that you're able to sort of play it under all sorts of different weather conditions, for instance, and make sure it doesn't change in a way that uh, is jarring to you. Um, and, and just settle in with it a little bit as much as you can. Um, because as I said, it's a major decision. But it would be really fun. That's the thing. <laughs> I would be like a kid in a candy shop for real. I would have so much fun if that situation were to occur. So anyone out there listening, if, if you wanted to help me out and give me carte blanche to get a new violin, I'm open <laughs> to the idea. <laughs> and they can come to some of, the, some of the auditions and listen to it and give you their Absolutely. opinion. Absolutely. Yes. That would, that would work out. Yes. Now, <laughs> let me, let, let's go a step further here. Most of the violins that we see in Chautauqua Symphony or in a, a, a major, any professional symphony, are very expensive items. And are most of those purchased anew, or, or where, do they, where do they come mm -hmm. from? So another excellent question. Uh, so as you and the general public are probably familiar with, a lot of fantastic violins come out of Italy in, uh, in the 17th century or so, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so my violin was made in 1699 in Brescia, and many wonderful violins are old like that, but because they've become collector's items and the cost has become increasingly prohibitive, uh, there's a huge market now for new makers. So I know a lot of my colleagues who have truly excellent violins made with contemporary violin makers. 
Um, and those are not cheap either. That's mm -hmm. not to say, I mean, you know, you, you're talking, uh, you know, six figures for sure, mm -hmm. um, upper six figures probably. But, um, but the craftsmanship is excellent. You know, we know who those good makers are and, and the process would be very similar. They'd just go to those makers, they'd ask to try. Now, sometimes if someone is very lucky, they might be able to commission an instrument specifically for them. Um, so I know that those things happen. I don't have quite as much experience in that area because I, I went about getting my violin sort of the more traditional route. So, but yeah, there's quite a mix. And I would say that nowadays more and more people are looking towards modern violin makers just because it's simply cost prohibitive to mm -hmm. get old Italian. Mm -hmm. Are there uh, pianos there are names, Steinway, mm -hmm. Bosendorf, Rafazio, mm -hmm. are there names in, in violins that we yeah. should listen to? Well, Stradivarius, of course. Okay. Guaneri, Del Gesù, um, Guadagnini, uh, basically any Italian name that you'll hear in connection with violins is a pretty good name, okay. honestly. Um, there's a French shop called Viome, and many of those Viome violins are excellent violins as well. Um, and some of the modern makers that are very well known are Joseph Curtin of Curtin and Alf. Um, where, where there are, are many others that I'm... I'm and wh where's Curtin located? Uh, I, I, tell, I, me, tell me they're American. Uh, they are. Good. Um, but I want to say Michigan, but I'm not absolutely sure, and, okay. and somebody's going to listen to this and laugh at me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't if know. We, if we say they're American, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> yes, they're American. Okay. Yes. And um, that works out uh, just, just well. Now tell me a little bit about the bow. Yeah. So the bow is almost arguably even more important really? than the violin because, as I heard someone say once, you can get used to the way that a, violin, a particular violin sounds. Now, if it sounds wonderful, that's fantastic. But, you know, maybe it sounds a little too bright and brassy or something like that. But once you listen to it and you're sort of, it's sort of like a smell that you'd stop noticing after a mm -hmm. while. <laughs> um, but the bow itself is the tool that we're using to produce sound. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that tool needs to be really great. Mm -hmm. um, so we spend a long time looking for a bow that will match what we need to do as performers that will match the particular violin that we have. So all of those are variables that come into our decision to purchase a bow. So that's a tough, it's sometimes a tough search. And of course there are excellent modern makers of bows as well. Um, and then there are some, some old, older bows that have excellent reputations. Uh, so all of those are factors. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now, um, cases are significant issues I would assume. And when you, when you transport your violin coming from uh, Virginia to New York, tell me about the care. Well, um, the care of the violin is a daily concern. So there are certain things that we have to do daily. We, you may not know that uh, on, on our bows we use rosin, mm -hmm. similar to what you know, gymnasts use to prevent themselves from uh, st sticking or slipping. Um, so that rosin comes off as we play, and there's a very fine dust of rosin usually on the instrument. After we play, we have to make sure that's wiped away every time we play because it can erode the varnish, which makes the violin very valuable and affects the sound. Um, so that's one thing that we do. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking the violin over as temperature and humidity changes to make sure that there are no cracks or openings at the seams, which happens quite often. And when we're traveling, of course, we want to make sure it's as secure as possible. Uh, you never leave it out of your sight. You never leave it in the car, um, ever. <laughs> you, d you just have to take it with you everywhere you go. Um, you, you can't check it at the airport. You, it has to come with you onto the plane, which is um, a constant source of stress for us traveling in, in addition to all the normal travel, travel stressors. So uh, it's something we have to think about constantly and, uh, and make sure that, of course, they're always insured. And most good orchestras will provide instrument insurance for you. Um, so, but of course, you have to have it insured and you have to do certain things to make sure that you're you know, taking care of it properly in accordance with your insurance policy. Mm -hmm. and, and part of that is not leaving it in the car and, and not checking it at the airport. So all of those things we are constantly concerned with and thinking about and thinking about, oh, I just heard about this new case. And is it, is it protective? Uh, is it light enough to carry? Because among other things, we have to worry about overuse injuries and stress injuries from simply playing the same motions all the time. 
And often that can be exacerbated by very heavy cases that we're carrying either in our arms or over our shoulders. So it's a constant balancing act between a case that's light but strong and protective. And we're always looking for that, and, and also in our price range, <laughs> we're always looking for that. Now, so when you travel, let's say you're going from Northern Virginia to, I'm sorry, from uh, Norfolk to mm -hmm. Pittsburgh to, to do a, yes. a run with the uh, pit there. Yeah. Where does the violin stay in your car? <laughs> um, well, it goes right behind me, uh, driver's side, right behind me. So I have a minivan, so right there, and, and, um, and I sort of protect it with, you know, maybe my luggage on one side and my tote bag with my music on the other, just to make sure it's not going to get jostled around too much. Um, and then I take it out at every rest stop, bring it in with me. <laughs> and that's, that's no discussion, that's simply the way it is. It, it's simply the way it is, and I've done that trip many times that you just described. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know that 400 miles very well. <laughs> <laughs> But indeed, as, as I think you shared with me, you have family in, in Pittsburgh. I do, yeah. And so that's a, that's a fun yes. trip, presumably. Yes, it's been a real blessing to be able to play beautiful music with one of the world's greatest orchestras mm -hmm. and then have some time with my cousins and, and my uncle to catch up and, um, and really get to know them better. Uh, it just feels, I, I just feel incredibly lucky every time I'm able to do that. That's wonderful, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. I can't believe we've only got a few minutes left. Oh. Now, you have another generation of Chautauquans here. Tell me a little bit about them. My sons, Byron and Blake. Mm -hmm. uh, Byron is 19, and he's been a Chautauquan since he was five months old. Mm -hmm. And uh, he is getting ready to attend Massachusetts Maritime Academy in Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts. He grew up sailing, and he sailed on Chautauqua Lake. Uh, ever since he was very young and for the past three seasons he's been working at the sailing center in Chautauqua teaching sailing to clubbers and anyone who comes to rent. Um, he's great. We, uh, their father and I both started them out playing violin so mm -hmm. Byron can play the violin but it never really took for him. Uh, he, <laughs> he had a couple famous quotes about it. He said, I thought it was going to be fun but it's not when he was very young. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he, he loves to be on boats, so we knew that he was going to do something with that, and he's very excited to start uh, his, um, his studies at Mass Maritime. And my younger son, Blake, is 15, and violin did take with him. He, uh, he caught the bug, as we say, and uh, he fell in love with it. He's the type of kid that while he's doing his math homework, he's listening to Baroque hurdy-gurdy music on YouTube. And there's just nothing that you can do for that. <laughs> they, they get that bug in them. And, uh, and he's become an excellent violinist in his own right. And it's actually very fun to see. We can connect now on a musical level. Um, you know, he's, he's very nearly there in terms of technical, technical ability. Um, so there's lots for us to share. And mm -hmm. of course, being in Chautauqua for him is amazing. Uh, when Augustine Hellish comes today, he gave a chamber music performance and then he'll be performing again Thursday night. And he's one of the world's greatest violinists, and uh, Blake is very, very excited to come see him. So he's, he's really lucky to, uh, to have grown up coming to Chautauqua as a violinist. That's terrific. Now, mm -hmm. let me get back. One more question will take me back to the instruments. When we talked earlier, you indicated that you like other types of music besides the sort of traditional classical things that are done by the symphony. Can you tell me a little bit about those? Sure. Um, well, I, th I think I was telling you earlier about uh, my parents are not musicians. Mm -hmm. um, they enjoyed playing music. My mother played piano, my father played some guitar, uh, but they were hippies. So the music that I grew up listening to was uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and folk music, and my dad liked Led Zeppelin and Cream. So for me, that was sort of uh, my mother tongue and what I was used to. So I was lucky enough to, uh, I own an electric violin, actually, a six-string electric violin. And I was lucky enough to be able to perform with that um, as, a, as a substitute violinist for uh, a Led Zeppelin cover band that travels and performs a symphony. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do the Stairway to Heaven solo, and uh, that was great fun. I enjoy doing that. Um, I've also been composing mm -hmm. some music, uh, in most recently for an, an off-Broadway production by Royal Family Productions of Anne of Green Gables, which was an original play. Mm -hmm. And I composed the music for that, and it was choreographed and danced to, choreographed by Lorna Ventura, and it was amazing to 
hear and see the music that I composed being danced to in New York City. And I, I hope to be able to do some more of that uh, in the future. I also composed music for a punk band called Ember Ghost that's based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, they wanted to do an acoustic version of one of their albums as a tribute to their lead singer who'd passed away. So I wrote the music for them. And it's, it's actually on iTunes. You can, you can find that. <laughs> wow. And that's, that's fun for me, too, to hear that music that I wrote being performed. So uh, I think as I go through my career and I look to, to branch out um, into other directions and sort of uh, get different skill sets, that's an area that I'd like to pursue. Great. Sure. I have a question I'd like to ask okay. everybody, and I shape it a little bit to the guest. Okay. And, and it's sort of what I look at our role as a, the senior people here at Chautauqua. And if a young Chautauquan would come to you and say, I'm very interested in a career in music, and it's, it's a quiet spot, and that person is looking for a substantive answer, what would you tell? What would you say? I'd ask some more questions Go so I it. could narrow it down. What instrument, what style of music? Um, I would say practice as much as possible and surround yourself by the best teachers that you can, um, however you can do it. Uh, play as much as you can. Play for as many people as you can that are known to be excellent in the field. and. Don't stop, don't give up. Because if there's anything I've learned, it's, it's uh, that if you stick with it long enough, there will be a place for you in, in, in the field that you love. That I know for sure. Mm -hmm. How many hours a day should somebody plan on practicing? It depends on their stage of learning. Mm -hmm. um, but if someone is a very serious violinist, I would say two hours a day is a minimum. Um, many of us have periods in our lives, and myself included, where we regularly practiced from six to eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. um, but two hours a day will, will keep you in shape for sure. If you're ever going to a major music school, or just pick Fredonia because that's close. Okay. How many hours a day should they anticipate as a music major mm -hmm. practicing their As a instrument? music major working towards a bachelor's degree, I would suggest two to four hours a day. You know, so the person's, About that. I mean, the person's in line, they want to get a performance certificate, so that's, that's it, two to four hours a day, yeah. minimum, l block it out yes. without interruption. Yes, you can take some breaks, that's okay. Take a, take a little break, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's great. Now, Amanda, we are almost out of time. Uh -huh. What else do we need to cover? Uh, it seems like you've covered quite a bit, mm -hmm. and I've really enjoyed talking about all the different aspects of what I do. Um, come and see the Chautauqua Symphony. It's really an excellent orchestra. It's sort of an all-star orchestra. We have people from many orchestras around the country and around the world, and I feel so privileged to be able to play with them on a regular basis. I learn from them, and uh, I can't wait to get started playing again after this broken arm heals up. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I'd like to add. <laughs> That's going to work out great. Okay. And stay with it, and we'll, we'll find you a good orthopedist. <laughs> Sounds and, good. Uh, that's great. We are out of time. Thank you so very much. Um, I promise you're coming back, and I got a million more questions for you. Okay. So this was terrific. Thank you very so much. Very fun. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.